Amen. All right. Genesis chapter number 15. And good morning. Happy Resurrection Day. And uh, for some of you that are not accustomed to that, it's just because uh, the, the rest of the world celebrates bunnies and eggs and uh, chocolate and peanut butter. And um, those kind of things we celebrate. This is the day that is commemorated by the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And without that occurring, literally, you'll hear a message about it this morning. There'd be no point in us even being here. I mean, to just be a better moral person and then die and no longer exist anywhere, you know, or to exist out of the body. Uh, does you no benefit at all. You're seeing a day and time in which uh, individuals are getting a little bit more of a Western religion in their mindset or Eastern religion in their mindset where uh, they're thinking that uh, the bodily resurrection is not something that occurs. You know, back in, uh, in the early days when you had all the philosophers that were around, most of them believed that you wanted to escape your body and that you wouldn't want to be burdened with your body in eternity. So you wind up just existing in a, a, no, a, a shapeless form, but you're able to have all the mindsets that you have now. You think about that for a moment, if you would just consider the thoughts that are in your mind, if they're not turned into action, for instance, let's take eating, for instance. Uh, if you could think about eating, but could never taste food, what good would that do for you? I mean, isn't the pleasure in the tasting of the food? I mean, I can think cinnamon rolls all day long, but I'd much rather eat them, right? Well, but you're thinking of them, that should be good enough for you. Uh, Christian scientists believed for a long time that nobody ever got sick. And what they thought was is that all sickness resided in your mind. I've often wondered if they had a toothache, if that would resign in their mind. I could say it's all in their head, but it's definitely not in their mind. There's nothing worse than a bad toothache. And, uh, but they believed that. So anyway, I'm glad and appreciate very much you being here. It's a special day. We are expecting a lot of visitors to be here. And I'm glad. I know a lot of preachers make fun, and I did too in my earlier days of, you know, they only show up Easter and Christmas and for funerals and weddings. But I'm glad they come whenever they come. Uh, you know, there's many a person that came on an, on an Easter and then said, you know something, I think uh, maybe I need a little bit more of this. And then they wind up getting saved and they become a part. I don't know where you had your entrance way. I had mine in nine months before I was born. And uh, I was raised on drugs. I was drugged to church every time the doors were open. <laughs> I didn't have a choice. My mom and dad were big into, uh, I guess some people would call it child abuse. They were big into... Um, uh, brainwashing. Uh, they didn't put me under Chinese torture and let the water drip on me or whatever. I, I grew up understanding from a very early age that there are certain things I didn't get choices in. And one of those choices was not just you eat everything on your plate that's put before you. And that doesn't mean they stacked it mountain high and that kind of thing, but you had to learn to taste foods you didn't like and, and those kind of things. But one of the things that was never open for discussion at all was going to church. And I didn't consider it abuse at all. Nowadays, you're in a situation where if you ask or tell a kid that you're going to go to church, you've even removed it and gone so far as, as you can't even tell the kid, your own child, they're a male or a female. So you didn't, wouldn't dare tell them that. Now here's where they deviate. But you better tell them to go to school. You obviously haven't understood how federal money works. You know why they're so worried about your kid being in school in the public school? They get so many dollars for every behind that's in the seat. Yep. Yep. Check it out. Just Siri it or Google it or whatever. You're thinking, well, what is that dirty little secret? That's why truant officers came around. They want to force your kid into going into school because why? That's a dollar bills long before older age. That's why the homeschool first started. There was such a huge pushback and they made those of you that homeschooled like you were in some kind of cult or something. The reason is you're taking money out of their pocketbook. Amen. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't work that way in college. In college, you pay. 
So they don't care if you come or not. They get their money up front. Right? right. Student loans. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You, you figure you need to go to college and you go to college. That's fine. I get that. And you take out a student loan and you figure that'll be okay. And then the next thing you know, you have a guy come in and say, I'll just forgive all the loans. Well, that's a great principle to teach people. That's the same thing in my day they called robbery. You walk in, I'm taking the money. I don't intend to ever pay it back. Well, what a, what a, what a great uh, uh, lesson in life to teach somebody. Just borrow money and default on your loan. How dare you take my car after I'm three months behind in payments? I have a right to that car. How dare you foreclose on my house when I bought more house than I can afford? But it's my house. No, it's not. It belongs to the bank. That's collateral. They're giving you the benefit of moving in there and the price you pay is interest. Well, I, I can't believe they're charging me interest. You know, the Bible says don't charge usury. You've got that way out of context. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer for you. I'm telling you, you live up in a messed up society nowadays. Amen. You have, I can't even imagine in, in, in my day to have a transvestite come in dressed up like a rainbow and uh, to, to be there as a, dressed up like a rainbow and to read a children's story to children. They have never found that guy. Nowadays, you're the one that goes to jail if, if, you, if you oppose that or you say, well, if that's going to be with my kid, oh, well, we're going to call law enforcement on you. You didn't let your kid come to school. No, because look at what you're doing. You must not be aware. I guess you're, you're, some of you are looking shocked. Is this Easter? Met? No, that's coming in about an hour. But some of you look shocked. Are you aware of some of the published material that they're wanting to teach your sixth graders? Do you, have you even looked at how graphic that stuff is? Why, you wouldn't even allow that. I hope you wouldn't allow that stuff in your house for a child. Well, preacher, you know, you just have to grow up and accept reality. You know, this is what's happening nowadays and all that kind of stuff. The kids are inquisitive enough, ladies and gentlemen, then for you to trip their trigger at an early age. You know what they're trying to do? I'll just let you in on a little secret. What they're trying to do is they're trying to reverse the norms. And what they believe, this is what they honestly believe, out of chaos comes order. They want to create chaos. Now, I'm not into Ayurvedic medicine and, and, uh, and Eastern chakras and all that other kind of stuff. But one of the things you would know if you paid any attention to the colors that they say are lined up in you and those colors run in a certain direction for those things. Do you know what your homosexual rainbow flag does? It reverses the colors. Go look at it if you think I'm kidding you. It turns it upside down. There's an order here. There's disorder here. The male is no longer male. The male is female. I saw a commercial two days ago. Uh, they got, they're given uh, 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 medicine now, uh, hormone blockers to kids as early as three years of age. And so they have this uh, girl who wants to become a, a boy and her parents have allowed her to have um, hormone injections. It's an advertisement for a pharmaceutical company. And they got the girl wanting to turn into a boy and if you look real close, you check it and see if I'm lying to you. They got her there and she's growing a mustache. Well, you know the weird thing is, he, if he was a he, is not even old enough to be growing a mustache yet, but they're giving him medicine so that they can change it. You're back in the days of the 19, late 1930s and 40s when Hitler's running experiments on people. You don't even know what's happening. And you have a guy up there, Goebbels is his ministry of propaganda, and you got... Um, uh, what's his name there, running all of those uh, um, experiments and stuff to see if they can change male to female and female to may, male and make a maphrodite. You know, you're born with both types and you decide which one you want to be. 
You older people, you need to listen to me. They're not after you. You're too set in your ways. When I say older, I mean anything over 50. I'm not being offensive. I'm just simply saying, you don't matter to them. You're in the way. They just soon genocide you. Literally. You don't, they don't, you're, you're in the way. What are they after? They are after your kids and your grandkids. And I, I, I hate to say this in the wrong fashion. You don't have enough sense to see it. You just go along with it. And it's like, well, you know, the, the kids are, yet. no, uh-uh. They're educating them far more than reading and writing and arithmetic. Amen. And trying to teach them a lifestyle. And then you go into the halls of the public school, and if you don't feel like you're being treated fairly by your mom and daddy, call this 800 number and let somebody know about it. And, well, I don't think my mom and dad are treating me fair. They won't give me a cell phone. You have kids now in elementary school and they're no longer carrying books. They got iPads. Well, what's the big deal? Well, can I just say this with all due respect? You're an absolute fool. Amen. If you think that kid is not looking at stuff on that iPad, he has no business looking at. You do. You think that kid's not going to be like, I'm in the airport the other day and they're sitting on a plane and this kid's playing some game or something or another and they're shooting back and forth and so on and so forth. The kid couldn't be more than five, maybe six years of age. A little uh, blonde, toe-headed girl is sitting there and the mom's frustrated on her phone like that and the kid just stops and reaches up there and hands her the phone and goes, and then goes back to playing her game. And the mom says, thank you, honey. I, I never have been able to figure out how to fix that. Oh, well, preacher, that's just the age you live in. Well, then have me removed. Go hide me under a rock somewhere. Wow, out with that stuff. If that's what you want to do, raise your kid, they're your kids. But I'm going to preach against it. You know what? Genesis chapter 15. We've been talking about different personality types in the Bible. And we're going to deal with an individual here that has a tendency... Uh, to be a little bit uh, more introverted. A lot of people think that everybody in the Bible is extroverted. You remember the story by the man named Gideon? A story about that man named uh, Gideon is in that case, <laughs> speaking of electronic, I better turn my phone off here. Uh, the man named Gideon is over there during the days when their country has been taken over. Israel is under the judgment of God. It's in the, the book of Judges there, and he's doing that which is right in their own eyes. And those uh, Chaldeans and the people around them, what they would do is, is in the springtime, they would come in, or the fall time, excuse me, they would come in during harvest, and they would turn all their animals loose in their fields. And they would run them out of their houses and all the Israelites would hide back up in the caves and in the mountains and those kinds of things. And no war, no warriors, no individuals that stand up for it when they came in. So Israel had spent all their time raising their crops, doing everything that needed to be done, getting ready to go to harvest. And then in comes this invading troops and turn all their animals loose and just let them eat, just like locusts, eat uh, the ground bare. The animals just come in and destroy everything and the people come in and run all the people in the town. Now they didn't kill them, they ran them out. Made them go hide in the rocks and the crevices and up in the caves and then when they got finished and ravishing that town, then they moved out and then the Israelites came right back down. That's the days of what's going on with Gideon. Gideon's daddy had become a, an individual who was a Baal worshiper. He had gotten along with them because, you know, they're in the invading troops and when in Rome, do as Rome. And uh, Gideon's dad was known to be a big time Baal worshiper and he had risen in the, the, uh, the ranks of that kind of thing. Gideon was a no name nobody. And he's over there threshing wheat. And what he's doing is, is in the background where nobody can see him, he's throwing the wheat up. Now, in the old days, what they did was in order to separate the grain from the wheat, is they would put the, cut the wheat down and then put it on a threshing floor. And they would beat the wheat until the grain came off. And then they would throw that up in the air, the, the chaff. And the wind would blow the chaff away, the stalks away, you might know better. That'd leave the grain on the floor there. And then they'd gather that up and grind it to flour, do whatever it is they were planning on doing with it. 
And Gideon's back there one day and he's threshing uh, the wheat there and he's throwing it up and that kind of a thing in a hidden manner because you don't want the people to know you have food. They'd come in and take the food away from you. And the Lord comes to Gideon and says, Thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon hasn't done anything to distinguish himself as a mighty man of anything. As a matter of fact, he's hiding. He's introverted. He's not considered to be a warrior. He's not known to be a warrior. You know him at the end of the story, but his beginning had nothing to do with that. Gideon is over there doing what he's supposed to do to feed his family and to do the things that he was required to do in spite of the fact that that whole nation is under the thumb of these uh, invading troops. And the Lord said, Thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon kind of looks around there and says, I don't know who you're talking to. And the Lord said, I'm talking to you. And he said, uh, oh, Okay, well, what would you have me to do? And he said, the first thing I want you to do is, and this is a difficult thing, especially for Southerners. He said, the first thing I want you to do is, is I want you to go down and tear your Baal worship and father's altar down. And he's got a prize winning uh, calf over there that he's going to offer on that special day for Baal. And he's going to wind up offering those kind of things. This is why you got a thing the other day from uh, Brother Sam about the deal Easter. That connected to uh, the pagan worship. I don't care what anybody tells you. It's connected to pagan worship. It's wickedness. I mean, who worships fertility? Who, worship, who thinks eggs come from bunnies? But it's all connected because you know when you mention bunnies... They have the reputation of, uh, shall we say, r replicating rather rapidly. <laughs> not what bunnies are known for. Why are you, why would you, at any rate. And so he comes up there and he said, you want me to tear it down? He said, yeah. He said, uh, go get you some guys. And he said, I want you to tear it down. Well, what do we do? You got to tear it down. And then he tells him after he tears it down. So Gideon goes out and uh, I guess probably a Sunday night service in Independent Baptist Church, I guess. He goes out. He can't find but 10 people that'll stand with him. You don't think that'll try your faith? Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, you're in an, a country that is being controlled by the enemy. You're coming against your own dad who is a big shot in Baal worship. And the Lord wants you to go in there and physically tear down his altar and kill his prize winning calf. That's going to be all, that, that's a big ask. And he can only find 10? I don't know, man. That's a big ask. And he doesn't stop there. After he gets done with it, then you know what he says to him? He said, now I want you to build the right altar. Lord, you do realize I'm in the middle of Baal worship in company. I do. You, I'm in country. You realize that we're overwhelmed right now by, yeah, I understand. Lord, you know I'm not a warrior. I never fought a day in my life. I never even had my nose bloodied. I haven't played any sports. I don't know anything about aches and pains and hurts and stuff. I don't know how to swing a sword. I mean, these people are sure to come out. Just build the altar, Gideon. Oh, okay, Lord. So he builds the altar. I'm talking about the Lord using an introvert. Somebody that's not known. And then he says to him, he said, I'll tell you what we're going to do, Gideon. I said, I'm going to use you now to, we're going to run these people out of your country. And Gideon said, uh, you're going to use me? I never led troops a day in my life. I don't know anything about leadership. I don't know anything about uh, troop uh, movements. I don't know anything about, Lord said, don't worry about it. Just trust me. And so Gideon puts out a call and a few thousand men show up there. And the Lord says, uh, you got way too many people. And Gideon said, I, I got way too many people. He said, yeah, you got way too many people. We need to thin the crowd out. And he winds up thinning that crowd out two different times. And the last time has to do with how they drank water. That boy's gone from 3,000 to a tenth of what he had. He's down to 300 people. And then he says, now go get the bad guys. <laughs> now, could you blame Gideon for saying, um, Lord, would you mind if I put a fleece out? I mean, I'm willing to go, but you're asking me to do something that doesn't make any sense. I'm introverted. I know how to thresh wheat. I know nothing at all about building and about leading troops and about military stuff. And you're asking me to go against a well-trained army. Sounds a little like David, doesn't it? And so he goes up there. Some of you may have not know the story, so I'll give you the end of the story before we move into Abraham here. And then he comes up there and he says to him, okay, I tell you what, Lord, if it's you, 
He said, uh, I, uh, wet, the flea, or, 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 uh, wet the ground and leave the fleece dry. And so he puts the fleece out there, a, a coat, a garment, a, a, a covering, and he leaves it out there and he goes out the next day, man. I mean, you couldn't even wring out enough water to get a thimble full of water out of it. And should that be enough? Well, I don't know. Is that enough for you? <laughs> Still some pretty insurmountable task, isn't it? And so he says to him, he said, uh, okay, Lord, now I'm not saying that wasn't you, but I, but I, you know, that's kind of a small thing. I'll tell you what let's do. This time let's narrow that thing down and let's make it a little bit more of a pinpoint accuracy. Uh, this time come down here and wet the fleece and let the ground be dry. And he goes out there the next day and that thing looks like it's been sitting in the shower all the time. I mean, he's wringing out buckets of water out of that thing. And the ground around him just as dry as a baby powder, man. It's just dry as cracker juice. And he said, okay, Gideon, what else do you need to know? And he said, nothing, Lord. What do you want me to do? Well, I'll tell you what I'd like for you to do. Get you uh, spears, Lord, and habergans, Lord, and, and uh, shields and protectors and helmets and, and roll out the artillery and get the tanks and stuff. The Lord said, no, I, I think here's what I'd like for you to do, Gideon. Uh, get you a, a candle and a pitcher. Like a pitcher, you mean like baseball, Lord? No, a pitcher like in you put water in. <laughs> and a horn. Uh, okay. And go get them. <laughs> I don't know. You think about that. Were well, you going to hit him in the head with a pitcher and burn him with a candle? <laughs> and then blow the horn to blow out their... I mean, it doesn't even make any sense. And the Lord said, now here's what I want you to do. Get out in this particular area and I want you to blow the horn. And he said, I want everybody's candle underneath that uh, pitcher. And after you blow the horn, he said, what I want you to do is break that pitcher and let that light shine. He said, okay, Lord, what are we going to do with the engagement? I'll take care of the engagement, Gideon. Don't worry about that, <laughs> you mighty man of valor. His valor comes in the fact that he trusts the Lord. Amen. He doesn't holler, let's go get them, guys, and we'll chase them into eternity. <laughs> he says, okay, guys, when I blow the horn, <laughs> break the pitcher and let your light so shine. <laughs> Don't you know those people that are with him are thinking, you have lost your mind. We're going to be sitting ducks, man. As soon as they see us up there on that hill, those people are going to charge up the hill. And I mean, they are going to kill us to a fare thee well. And he blow the horn and bust the pitchers. And all of a sudden, the people look up and the Lord calls confusion. And they wind up killing themselves. You say, what did he do that with? An introvert? And do it with a, somebody that was loud, some great commander, some ability that went to a whole bunch of classes and knows certain things about leadership. Preacher, why do you tell me that story? God can use anybody if they're willing. I'll give you another introverted. I'll give you a woman. It's not, not as common to find introverted women it is, 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 as you might think as it is a man. But an introverted woman, I'll give you one before I get to Abraham here. Uh, Mary is over in the New Testament. The first appearance there when Mary comes along is that the Lord comes by over there and Martha's making some uh, breakfast or dinner or lunch or some kind of a meal. And while she's making that meal, the Lord gets ready to speak. He gets ready to talk. And uh, Mary just sits down at His feet. And Martha gets mad about that kind of a thing. But Mary, she's not a real talker. The only time you find her talking a little bit is all the way over there in John 14, when, or John 11, excuse me, when uh, Lazarus dies. But beyond that, you don't ever see her saying much. She's just kind of quiet. She's unassuming. She doesn't even look talented. I'm not like a lot of people that think, you know, maybe the reason that Martha, that she didn't work in the kitchen is because she couldn't cook. Maybe Martha didn't want her in there because she got in the way. May, I, don't, I don't know why, but the Bible says that she's over there and Martha gets all in a fluster over the thing because Mary's not doing anything. And the Lord said, no, she's doing something. She chose the better part. Amen. She never opened her mouth. She just sat down and listened. She never cooked a meal. Can you find for me a place in the Bible where Mary made a meal? 
Can you find for me a place in the Bible where she taught a Sunday school class? Can you find for me a place in the Bible where she uh, led the singing in something or sang a solo or played an instrument? You know all you find about Mary? You just find about her doing what she can do. Can you find a place in the Bible where a memorial was made to anybody else other than the woman who just did what she could? You say, well, what are you saying? I'm saying God can use anybody if they're just willing to do what God wants them to do. Amen. You don't have to be something great in the sight of other people, ladies and gentlemen. You don't have to be trying to achieve great things. This ha you don't know what God's doing with people. You get in such a big rush to get in the spotlight. Let me give you a caution about spotlights. First of all, it shows every crack and crevice and every wrinkle and every blemish you have. That's why you ladies, you have makeup mirrors. That light that you're looking in is brighter than any light you'll walk in front of during the day. It's done to accent where the wrinkles are and where the zits are and where the blackheads are and where the other thing, the, the crow's feet, where the crow hops around on you or whatever and leaves that stuff and that kind of thing and the cracks in your lip. Trust me when I tell you, when you start getting old, you don't need bright light to see it. Amen. It just, it's just there. I mean, it starts off and it looks like a little tiny crack in the sidewalk. And by the time you get old, it looks like the Grand Canyon, man. I mean, it's like, man, I'm afraid I'm going to fall into that thing. It's so, so bad. And things begin to sad. And then all of a sudden, your high cheekbones turn down to sagging jaws and that kind of thing. Men have a tendency to wind up right here. They lose their hind end and they lose their legs. <coughs> They look like Winston Churchill walking around, you know. The reason they walk like this, they're trying to hide that they ain't got nothing caboose anymore. It ain't, it ain't there. You know, it's gone. You say, well, it, 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 your, your body's eating your strength. <laughs> but ladies, that, that thing about the face, it's a, it's a big deal. Then the next thing you know, you're thinking, well, what happened to me? I, I wound up getting older. Yeah, introverted women are not as, as normal as they are introverted men. You say, why? You always feel a need to be seen and to be heard because of what happened in the garden. Sometimes it's good for some of you because it makes you an overachiever. It makes you be able to achieve the things you got. But if you're not careful, that thing can make you feel like God can't use somebody like you. God can use somebody like you. God will use anybody that's willing to be used. Stipulation to do what He wants you to do, not what you want to do. Remember when we started this study, I told you and I gave you several examples that in the Bible, it's God choosing your path. You don't get to pick your path. Not when it comes to doing what God wants you to do. That's a hard thing for some of you. Lord, what do you want me to do? He comes up there to Mary and she comes and she breaks that alabaster box and pours that uh, perfume all over the Lord there and it runs out all over the creation. And the Bible says the boys were indignant. I think probably because they recognized that she had given them uh, some things that, uh, that they weren't going to give. I think she recognized that. I think she saw that. I mean, I think they saw that. And I think that was mad. And then Judas pops off and says, you should have given that to the poor. Well, it's pretty good for you to say that, Judas. You just spent getting paid off for betraying the Lord. But anyway, sometimes the scalded dog is always the one that yells the loudest. And so at any rate, Mary comes in there and does that. You know what the Lord does? The first thing He does. Ladies, if you could grab what I'm about to tell you, it'll help you so much you can't even imagine. Those boys are all talking about her. She's the only female there. Right? The Lord's not politically correct. He doesn't go along with the crowd. You know what he says to those boys? Let her alone. You're in a great spot if you have a husband giving you a fit, ma'am. You get out of the way. Don't get smacked when your husband does. You know what the Lord will do? He'll grab that man by the gruff of the scruff of the neck and say, Let her alone. And he rebukes those boys. And then uh, it runs along there. And you know what it says? I tell you what, he just puts, an, uh, puts a cherry on the uh, uh, ice cream sundae there. 
He says, uh, wherever this gospel is preached, tell them about Mary. This, let this be a memorial unto her. Any of you has ever been out to a cemetery? You know what they have? They have gravestones. You say, what are they? Well, they're to mark the headstone of where somebody... No, they're not. They're a memorial to a life that was led. If you've never done that, I don't recommend you do it at nighttime. It's just kind of spooky. But, but, but the daytime, you ought to walk through there. You'd be surprised what you can learn about how somebody lived by how they died. You can go through there, and in most cases, especially around Christians, you can get a good witness of the gospel in a gravestone. You say, what is it? It's a memorial. Let this, he says, be a memorial unto her. Here I am way up here in 2023, and I'm talking about a woman that is only known for doing what she could do, but in the Bible never tells you what she did, except for sitting and listening. That's all it says about her. Don't say she ever flipped a biscuit, vacuumed the floor, cleaned the toilet. Don't say. I didn't say she didn't do that. I just said she did what she could do, whatever that was. Preacher, why do you tell me that? To encourage you, you don't have to be something great. We have a lot of talented people here. They can play instruments and they can sing like Pavarotti and like whoever great sopranos are and things like that. And you know good and well, you've heard yourself in the shower and you set the recording because you know, and you, you're laughing because you know, it's like, how did he know that? I, I just know. <laughs> You set that recording and you get in the shower, man, and you get all worked up and then you start singing and that kind of a deal. And then you go play the recording and you're going, well, it must have got wet or something. There's no way, there's no way I sound like that. That can't be. I, there's, that's not possible. And so you do it again and you do it again and then you start messing with synthesizers and changing this and changing that. And before long you get to think, well, that, I guess that's not too bad. It sounds like two styrofoam lids running together. You can't practice that out of you. But I've seen individuals that aren't very talented at all to get up and they sing and just do it because of the Lord. And you know what happened? I've seen God breathe on that more than a professional. You say, why? Just doing what I can. Now I'll show you about a fellow here by the name of Abraham. He's a great patriarch. And by him, the nations are born out and the things that are done with the uh, with Abraham, he comes of the father of the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Here he is, Abram. This is before the Jews are even around. People ask all the time, were Adam and Eve Jews? No. They're Gentiles. The Jewish nation doesn't come along until after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and down through the line with Moses and the law and all that other kind of stuff. He's a Gentile. All those individuals that passed away before that time, they're Gentiles. What is Abram? He's a Gentile. He doesn't even have a Jewish name. Don't you think that's funny, though? Uh, they're forbidden from eating pork, and the Lord names him Abraham. <laughs> I think that's funny to me. I heard one preacher say, you know, that he changed his name from Abram to Abraham after he gave tithes to uh, Melchizedek. <laughs> the Lord will put some ham on you if you learn how to tithe. I've heard that said before. <laughs> But I think it's humorous, though, that the Lord says, now you can't have pork and, and so on and so forth, and then names him Abraham, like a constant reminder of that. All right, and then he comes along here, and he's going to make some promises to him. Now, he's introverted. He's easy to get along with. He's uh, calm. He's easygoing. Um, he, he, he doesn't reveal his feelings much. He's sort of, sort of what you would call kind of close to the vest. Now, now, don't mistake him for being weak because after a while, I'll show you, it won't be this morning the way it's going here, but uh, I'll show you that when his nephew gets in trouble and gets uh, taken captive when his nephew's over there in Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, his nephew gets taken, he grabs some of his herdsmen and leads them over there and recaptures them and gets all their stuff. So, I mean, I mean, he, he's no little wimp. I mean, but at this particular point, he's just getting started. He has a tendency to, to also be very, very loyal and very reliable. I mean, he's going to do what the Lord tells him to do. He'll bobble along the way and stumble a little bit. But Hebrews 11 says that he went out not knowing where he would go. He sought a city whose builder and maker was God. He's a great man of faith. God said to go and I'm willing to go. Well, where are you going to go? I don't know. Lord said he'll let me know when I get there. Amen. 
Well, that's a pretty rough deal. It's easier to know where I'm headed as soon as I leave out. That'd be like saying, you know, well, we're packed up for a trip. We're going to go take a, a vacation now. Where are you going? I don't know. <laughs> you see how that would be? You know what happens sometimes? Some of you lack the faith. You wouldn't be willing to say, Lord, wherever you go, I'll go. Isn't that what Ruth said to uh, Naomi? Amen. She didn't say it to Boaz. She said it to Naomi. I know you lose it in uh, funerals. I mean, uh, uh, wedding ceremonies, <clears throat> but she says that to her mother-in-law. And when she gets up there, she says, well, your people will be my people and wherever you go, I'll go. And wherever you lodge, I'll lodge and so on and so forth. Isn't that what she said? Going out, doesn't know where she's going to go. I'm just going to do what you tell me to do. That's Abram. Abram said, okay, don't even believe, don't even think about why you'd even call me in the first place. But Okay, if that's what you want me to do, not knowing every day, am I going to get there today? Am I going to get there tomorrow? They get into a place, they put the tent pegs down, stretch the black badger skins over the top, have a Bedouin style kind of a, a lifestyle, and they lay all that stuff out and roll out their rugs and get out the fire and they get ready to cook the meal and got the herds around there and kill a lamb or two and have the dinner and stuff and... Sarah comes up and says to him, uh, honey, is, is this where we're going to be? I don't know. Well, you think we're going to leave tomorrow? I don't know. Well, I mean, what are we going to do tomorrow? I don't know. Oh, sounds like some of your husbands. <laughs> You're going to fix the roof? I don't know. <laughs> you going to fix the plumbing? I don't know. <laughs> but you know what happens? He says to her, I don't know. I don't know. We'll know when we get there. He gets desperate during this particular time and he has a family attachment and he goes down to Egypt. God never told him to go to Egypt. There's a parenthetical period of time right there where the Lord just quits dealing with him because he made a choice to put daddy over God. There's a lesson in that, but don't, don't be too rough on him because he comes back. See, ladies and gentlemen, the secret is, is when you fall, get up. Amen. It's not that you fell. It's that when you fall, Amen. you get up. Amen. Okay, you made a mistake. You messed up. You did wrong. One act does not define your life. You so say, what do you do? I get up. And let me just say this to you. If you spend your life Always pointing out the failures of other, it means that your life amounts to nothing. You got something in your closet, or you might be in that closet for all I know. When you are continually consumed with other people's failure, you need to look in the mirror and go, well, maybe I just better shut up. The old saying is, he who live in glass house, be careful before he throws stones. The very idea that some uh, 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 brain donkey would come in and try to bring up something you did years ago. That's why I don't recommend you go to a high school reunion. They don't have college reunions. High school, back when you were adolescent, when you were stupider than a box of rocks. Amen. When you did the craziest stuff you've ever dreamed of doing, why don't you want to bury that stuff? You want to let your kids know about that? Burn the pictures, man. Daddy, is that you? Um, he doesn't know what you were doing. You know what he's going to do? Well, Daddy, you did it. 